Warning, the podcast you're about to listen to may contain graphic descriptions of violent assaults, murder, and adult language. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Murder Police Podcast, The Murder of Umi Southworth, Part 1. Murder Police fans, this is Wendy. We have an amazing five-part miniseries for you. This case covers the 2010 murder of Umi Southworth in Lexington, Kentucky. David, you were so excited to record this case with the three detectives that worked it. Why don't you tell the audience what it was that you enjoyed so much about it and what you think they will find interesting about it as well? Well, Wendy, I was excited because it was everything that this podcast is supposed to be. And I know our episodes always drive this home, but I really want the audience to hear from these detectives that actually do the work. And in some of the episodes, we've talked about what it would be like if you could sit in the homicide bay during a roundtable or a huddle and hear the talk. And we're going to give that to the audience in these next five episodes. And they're going to love it because you're going to really hear these three guys not only think and reminisce and remember and remind each other, you're going to hear exactly why they did the things they did the way they did them. The people we're going to have are fantastic. It starts with Bill Brislin, who is the lead on this case. Bill hasn't been on here before, and people are going to love how articulate he is, how detailed he is, and along with the other two, the sense of humor they share as a team. We also have Dave Richardson, who's a lieutenant with the Lexington Police Department right now. And Dave is, again, very well-spoken. And he brings kind of the techno gadget guy thing to the investigation in most investigations. When he was in homicide, he was pretty much the cutting edge on bringing newer technologies on board into the unit and into court. And then finally, we have Chris Schoonover. As we're all going to learn now, his official nickname is Schoon. And for our listeners who started with us from the beginning, he's the one that brought us three episodes on the murder of Haley McComb by serial killer Tommy Lynn Sells. So you know who Chris is, you know how well he speaks, and he's actually going to take the time to teach people what it's like to do this. You mentioned before, it's a five-part miniseries. So what we're going to do is we're going to deviate from our every other Tuesday schedule, and we're going to release these every Tuesday for five weeks so that they get closer together and people don't have to keep up. And I'm going to tell you now that this thing is going to be so fast and furious and move, we're not going to do introductions on the next four episodes. This is the last they're going to hear from you and me. Just when that episode drops, put it in, turn it on, and go and listen to it. The thing is about these three detectives is, like I said, it's going to be real detail with real teamwork and camaraderie among real friends. People are going to pick that up, and that's the thing that TV and movies tries to pretend and emulate and show, but you're going to feel it with these three when they start talking about this case over these next five episodes. The case itself, get into it, listen to it. And don't miss an episode. It is going to get deeper and go into more strange places than anything that we've recorded before. And when I say strange, mind-blowing strange. So hang on tight. It's really going to go there. The audience is in the right place at the right time with the Murder Police podcast. And you're going to be in the room with these three people while they talk about this. So with that, without any further ado, we are going to start the first of the five-part mini-series on the murder of Rumi Southworth. Well, gentlemen, thank you all for joining us today. Hello, Chris. How are you over there? Thank you. I'm doing very well. Thank you for having us today. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I started my career in the United States military with the U.S. Army as a criminal investigative uh, special agent. We investigated all kinds of felonies that were connected with the military and the U.S. government. We also investigated things that had a nexus to the military base, and such as drugs and weapons and things like that. After that, I was hired with the Federal Bureau of Prisons, where I worked in special investigative section. We would investigate jail breaks, any kind of scams that the inmates would have over the telephone. And then I was hired with the Lexington Police Department. Once I was hired with the Lexington Police Department, I did my usual stint as a 
you know, your training and that. And then I was asked to go up to the homicide unit and I was in the homicide unit for 19 years and retired in 2017. Nice. A lot of Thank experience there. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Dave, how are you? Good. Thanks for having us. Why don't you tell us a little about yourself? I came onto the police department in 2001. I uh, started off working patrol like everyone. I was fortunate enough to go to robbery homicide in about 2005. I spent seven years there, and I've always said those were the best seven years of my life, just the most fun I've ever had, met some great people, worked some great cases with people. I got promoted to sergeant, had to go back to the street, but was fortunate enough to come back and be the crime scene sergeant for uh, four years. And that was definitely the second favorite job I ever had on the police department. Uh, still got to work big cases, maybe not as much stress on the extended period like you'll hear with this case. Uh, this drug on for quite a while. Then now I'm currently a lieutenant and uh, spent some time in special victims during that time. Nice. Well, thank you. And Bill, how are you today? I'm great. How are you? I am great. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Started the police department in 1998. Graduated from the academy. Uh, did patrol for about a year. My goal in my career there at the police department was to be a detective. So I made it well known to my supervisors. So after about a year in patrol, I then was uh, interviewed for a position with the Bureau of Investigations with Crimes Against Children. And that was around 2000. And I was uh, accepted for that position and worked crimes against children and family abuse type cases from 2000 to 2002. And then once I had done a little stint with them, I had interest in homicide and then was brought over to homicide in 2002 and worked homicide until 2018. That was the highlight of my career. As Dave said, it was his best years. It was definitely my best years. Um, not only to work the cases, but to develop a friendship and a family within the unit that we had at that time. Following my time in homicide, I was then uh, selected by the chief at, for a chief appointed position within the intelligence unit. In that unit, I oversee violent crime scenes with the NIBIN system, which is the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network. It's a system that basically compares shell casings to different scenes to see if the same firearm was used. Uh, this is a liaison position between the Lexington Police Department and the ATF, and I currently hold that position currently, and that's about what I've done so far. Well, I think between the three of you all and this one sitting here next to me, we've got a lot of a lot of intelligence and experience in this room, so I appreciate you all coming. So with that, let's um, why don't why don't you all kind of dig in a little and give me an overall description of what this case is, what it's about, what stood out with the case that that our audience might find some interest in. What stands out to me is this case is something that anybody that lives in a cul-de-sac in a mainstream house in a neighborhood where you think things are all normal in your neighborhood. And when people close their doors in the evenings, no one has a clue what goes on behind those doors. And that's something that I would like people to know that be cautious, be aware, and maybe... If you see someone in need of help and they don't dare ask, maybe you should strike up a conversation and ask them because this case, no one knew what this woman was going through. Well, with, with that said, you spoke about this woman and what she was going through. Why don't you tell us a little bit about this victim, who she, who she was and, and what kind of risk factor stood out to, to make her obviously uh, the topic of our conversation today? Uh, I would just add that to piggyback what Chris said, uh, no one really knows what goes on behind closed doors. And in this case, Chris and I, and along with Dave, have spoke on this case before and presented it. And we actually called it fatal control, which is actually what we're going to see as we talk more about this case. But this is definitely a case that we all felt throughout the whole time that we investigated it. That's definitely a case that we wanted to solve and we wanted to see um, someone to be prosecuted for what he or she did, and you will see that in, at the end of this case. But to talk more about the victim, because you always talk more about the, the defendant, but in this case, the victim was Umi Southworth at, at the time. She was 44 years of age. She worked for the Fazolis here in Fayette County or in Lexington. She was a bookkeeper or an accountant there. She was currently uh, married to the defendant, which is going to be Donald Southworth, who worked for UPS, and she had two children, and they were married, actually, um, in the early 90s. Oh, I mean, I think she was a very soft-spoken person, didn't, didn't talk a lot at work about what she was involved with, just really went to work and did her job. So some of those people 
didn't realize the pain and suffering she was going through in her life. You'll hear throughout this presentation that we there was a lot of questions asked about the defendant. There was a lot of questions, did we have the right person? There was a lot of questions, what could we have done to help Umi? She had great relationships with her colleagues at work. Uh, you'll hear about them and how they assisted the police. Here's the thing, and, and I think all detectives will say this later on. Every case teaches you a lesson. And in this case, we learned several lessons. We've made several mistakes. We learned from those mistakes, and things have changed. Policies were made in the Lexington Police Department because of this case. If I can jump in, so this is a domestic violence case, correct? That's correct. What's different about working a domestic violence case? Can you all give me an idea? Because I'm sure you all have handled several of these before. I would say that domestic violence cases, you typically know the defendant in the case, but sometimes it's harder to prove because of the relationship that was going on between the two that we're unfamiliar with. So if you take out one of the individuals involved in the relationship, then you only have to re you only can rely on the statements made by the other individual that's still living. I'd like to add the other hurdle that you have to get over as a domestic violence case is your witnesses. Who are your best witnesses in domestic violence? Mm -hmm. They're children. To get a child to testify against one or the other parent is very difficult. It's a hurdle that's almost impossible to do. So I think a domestic violence case sometimes is more difficult than a whodunit homicide. I would agree with Chris on that, especially in this case, because once she was deceased, we were having to rely on a lot of information just coming from the defendant versus the children. And as Schoon said, as Chris said, the children were very protective of their parents, whether one was being physically or mentally abused. So it was a very hard situation for them to be put in and a very hard situation for them to talk about. Well, and of course, the child's always in denial that it's really going on because they don't want to believe it either everything that they're witnessing. Well, and I think also I work with children, and I think one thing that I see in the younger children I work with, which is predominantly five years and under, even when they know that abuse is going on, even if it's themselves, they protect that parent till the end. And there's that sense of obligation to the parent, even when they themselves are being abused, that they just... They don't want to be anywhere else. They don't want to be in foster homes. They want to be right there because they, they uphold that parent to the very end. Good stuff to know because a lot of people, I don't think, understand those intricacies. And like Chris, you made a good point that it's not a slam dunk. I mean, you can identify somebody early on, but the work is pretty difficult. We covered Amanda Ross with Todd Iddings, and he talked about the same thing, that making the arrest wasn't the big deal. It was everything after that. That said, uh, and now that we know a little bit about who she was, why don't you all just go ahead and start about how you were alerted to the case and, and just tell the story and let the audience hear how this went. Well, I mean, we were actually all together the night that this uh, happened. We were, like Bill said earlier, we were all kind of a family. So we were actually out for trivia night. We went on an on-call rotation so we knew who next was up for a homicide. We got the call and a couple of us went in to start that, left our other partners there to do trivia because we really thought this might be a, a kind of a two-hour case and we'd be back and hanging out with them in a few hours. And what we kind of learned was that it's not going to happen. And so started going through the process. I went to headquarters, started typing a search warrant just to get into the house and to search the property and everything. And uh, Bill and Chris went and started interviewing people about what they knew and what was at the scene. How did you come to be aware that this happened? How's, what's that look like as far as being a detective? How did, if you were out just hanging out, how did you find out about it, and what were the steps after that? We actually were all in the same car going to Mellow Mushroom for trivia night. And I remember Bill sitting next to me. He was on call and actually the next one to uh, what we call us catch a homicide. He was the next one up. So when he got the call, I could hear what he was saying in his voice, so I knew it was a call out. So we asked everybody else to get out, go in, and save us a place to sit. Order the two or three pictures, probably two pictures, because we do like to control ourselves in public. And uh, so after that, I told Bill, I'll just ride with you. This isn't going to be too long. I mean, this is open and shut. Well, come to find out on the way over, Bill receives another call. And the call, the information we receive is that Umi Southworth was reported missing earlier in the day. And there were several contacts with the police, with the patrol units, with the police department. And that they were currenting 
uh, the area behind the residence of Donald and Numi Southworth. That's what we knew going over there. Uh, when we get over there, we see several police vehicles with the lights on, some off. And Bill then walks up to the sergeant on patrol and receives a briefing from that sergeant. Come to find out during that day, Mr. Southworth really didn't want police and patrol cars at his house. So what we had done once we what we always do once we arrive at the scene, we get a briefing from the sergeant. There's a lot of intricate things going on all at once simultaneously. Bill is the primary on this case, so he's directing people on what to do. Now, remember, because later on you will be surprised that when we get called the homicide unit, that means someone is dead. So we assume that we're going and the coroner's already there. We're going to go and just go to the scene. We're going to limit the people in that scene. And we're going to evaluate the scene. We're going to have the forensic services unit, which is what Dave was talking about earlier. They're going to process that scene while we're interviewing witnesses. While that's going on, at the same time, we understand that there's children involved. So you have to use all your resources available to you at that time. So Bill had called in child services and the Crimes Against Children's unit to interview or at least come down and interview the daughters of Donald Southworth and Umi Southworth. So we got them a ride to the patrol or to the headquarters as well as Donald Southworth. And then we stayed and we what we usually do is we brief the Commonwealth attorney because the Commonwealth attorney likes to come to the scene early on to see what they have, because eventually we want to at least be able to prosecute this case and prosecute it successfully. So they are with us at the beginning. So Bill's act actually briefing the Commonwealth attorney and other attorneys that are with the Commonwealth attorney. At the same time, I'm trying to direct individuals of where to tape off the scene, what to do with certain cars, headlights, because it's becoming dark. And Dave, I'm contacting Dave, describing the, the residence, which is a fourplex brick. And this occurred... And like I said, it's it's a regular neighborhood. This occurred in the Meadowthorpe area. So now you have neighbors coming out and you have to control them. So do you need more patrol? You have to evaluate all that. So that's how we got involved with this case. More interviews to do too. More interviews. So what I would say to that is to piggyback what Chris said was the crime scene. Once we had arrived there at the, at the scene, there was a lot of moving parts. And as Chris said, and I'm sure if if anyone has listened to any of these podcasts before that they understand what happens at a crime scene as far as a homicide goes. But once we were on scene, I was having to talk to a lot of individuals, especially supervisors. I was getting different stories. Chris was also obtaining information for the search warrant to pass on to Dave so we could have that done. But what alerted the police to locating Umi in this case was the defendant in this case kept referring to, I've searched the ditch lawn, I've searched the ditch lawn. She's nowhere to be found around here. She's probably left and went with a boyfriend of hers, basically trying to have the police that are on scene probably leave and not search the area. And an officer actually located Umi in the ditch lawn. They, that's when we were notified that they actually had a body on scene. And it was believed that she was deceased. What did it look like uh, as far as where she was found, the body and everything? What kind of environment what it was? And was, there, was she concealed at all? Or So I'll go into that. But I think another important part is once a lead detective and homicide detectives arrive on scene, you are overseeing. And Dave, you know this because you did this for years. So I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Is that once you arrive on scene, you're, over, you're overseeing everything that goes. And this is your scene that you're in charge, you're in control, you are the responsible party. So in this scene, I observe what I believe to once we had, had located Umi in the ditch lawn behind the residence, I thought I had to I thought I had observed what looked like tire tracks um, leading through the backyard from the driveway area to the tree lawn. So I had everybody get off the grass before it got dark so we could photo photograph those tire tracks leading to the tree lawn because I felt that that could be important, matching up the tire treads to maybe a vehicle, specifically maybe the defendant's vehicle. So as it began to, began to get dark, the photographs were taken. Chris was still trying to do what he needed to do. I was still trying to do what I needed to do. But once we knew that she was back there, we always tried to contain the scene. So the only person back there at that time was only the officer that had found her. And when she had fa he had found her, she had um, visible signs of um, mortality. Her head had some uh, blunt force trauma. There was also some act 
maggot activity. So he believed her to be deceased and didn't check her vital signs. Um, at that point, the coroner and our supervisor, Paul Williams, had made his way back there. So we limit the amount of people in that area so we can control the scene for the forensics guys. Um, it was at that point that they were relaying the information to us. And she was basically, to answer your question, located under what I would describe as a box spring mattress type item. So basically the box spring. Um, and she was completely nude. And I would also describe her having a belt around her neck. Right. You couldn't see her. The box spring was laid flat onto the ground because later when we do conduct our interview with Donald Southworth, you have to understand what was seen back there for him to describe what he did. Yeah, it's a wooded area with a lot of vegetation and everything. Right. It's The backyard is maybe three quarters of an acre grass. You have a carport with no doors on it to the right of the residence. Back behind that is... It's not well trimmed, so there's high shrubs going up the back wall of the carport. And then the wooded area, there's one entrance maybe where a tree is bent over, and then you go back probably 25 feet where it's pretty dense, but there was a box spring there with a belt, not even the buckle portion, but the where you loop the holes under the mattress. It was sticking out. There was a log laying beside that and a bag of clothing. Mm -hmm. That was about it. Yeah, I would describe the scene. It almost appeared, and this plays into the end as well, not to give away too much, but it appeared that it could be a homeless camp where she was actually located under the box spring. But once they lifted the box spring, they saw specific items, and I'll let Dave talk about that as forensic, on the forensic side. But she had this belt basically once we could actually observe her loosely around her neck and she was completely nude and like I described earlier had obvious blunt force trauma to the head. So after we were at the crime scene, we asked patrol to bring Donald Southworth to the police department. He he doesn't realize that we know where Umi Southworth is. We know where Umi is and we ask him to bring his camera with him so we can have photos of Umi to help f locate her, and we can post those photos at different locations while we're searching for her. We'd like him to come down and give us background on Umi, maybe what her habits were, what she does during the day, who she works with. That way we can get what we call a baseline, which the key to getting anybody who, obviously in domestic violence, when a wife goes missing, the number one suspect is the husband. So we're going to at least eliminate him or we're going to stay with him as a suspect. We're going to get that out of the way right away. So we have him escorted to the police department with his camera. And let me back up just a little bit because I think it's important to know how we even got there was where she worked at. The employees, her friends were worried about her and they had actually been to this location looking for her because she had not shown up for work. This was her last day of work. So they were concerned about her. She knew, They knew that there were some issues going on between her and, and Donald whether that was actually physical or mental or any type of domestic violence, but they knew that there was something going on between the two of them. So when she didn't show up for work, the employees actually went to the residence looking for her early in the morning hours. Well, not early, but early afternoon around lunchtime. They made contact with the daughter of Umi. They, she believed that her mother had been at work, but the problem was her vehicle was in the carport or parked in the garage. It was parked on the side of the street, out front, along with her purse. So the late, we call them the Fazoli ladies, and you'll find out more about that. They actually contact the police. They have some belief that maybe she's missing. But at the same time, the defendant in this case, Donald Southworth, has also called the police, saying that his wife is missing, but she probably ran off with her boyfriend. There's no really concern. Can I file a missing persons report? And you'll hear more about that later on. So once that information comes in, there's some conversation later in the day because the Fazoli ladies actually hear a recorded message on the work phone and it sounds like a struggle. They are concerned and it was on Umi's phone. So they called the police again. They then contacted Donald Southworth and asked him to meet them at the residence. He was actually on his way back from Cincinnati. He said, I'll just meet you at another location. I don't want you coming to my home because I have the kids with me. And the police went ahead and responded to the residents of Meadowthorpe. And while they were on scene prior to his arrival, he ends up showing up there, which was very concerning to them. And that's where they made face to face contact. He said, I'm just trying to report my wife missing. That's when Chris and I got involved to have him escorted to the police department. 
and we were treating it basically at that point just as a missing person. And as Chris said, we were wanting to get a baseline. He brought his camera so we could observe photographs of her, and we wanted to see the last time she he had talked with her and the last time that she had been to work and just some different things like that. You talked about patrol being there so much earlier on. Did you all get any impression from the patrol officers that they were coming to any any opinions on this, talking to him throughout this? Did, was there any information that they offered that they were suspicious or anything? Yeah, that's what I mentioned earlier, the ditch line. Dawn had kept mentioning, I've searched around the house. I've searched the ditch line. From my understanding, when Chris and I spoke to the on, on-scene patrol officer that actually located her, it was more than just a number of times for him to cause or create some concern for him to actually go search the ditch line. It was almost like he was trying to conceal the information, but actually was just blab blabbing it, really, you know. Well, that's what I was going to ask. If he continues to mention the ditch line, did he not think that that's going to strike up a red flag? You keep talking about the ditch line. She is not in the ditch line. She's not in the ditch line. I would think that would be my first thought. Why does he keep talking about the ditch line? I think that's a good place where, Bill, why don't you talk about Donald Southworth and why he would think that the police would stay away from the ditch line? I believe what Schoon's talking about is that we we really began to know and understand, well, we think we do, um, Donald Southworth, based on the number of hours we've interviewed him, and we'll go into that later as well, but this individual or this gentleman was a sociopath he was thought he was smarter than thought he was smarter than the police but that's why he kept mentioning it he was basically saying it thinking we wouldn't check it because he like dave said that he was much smarter than we were and that whatever he did he could probably get by get away with it yes uh, his co-workers would say he was a great salesman you know he everybody believed what he said he spoke very convincingly, even during his interview. He spoke very convincingly and would he use things like he used Bill's good looks in the interview compared to what his life was. His was a lot rougher because he was a little smaller person, a little uglier than Bill that came up in the interview. So he felt that he could use people's strengths against them and still be smarter to them to where they would, hey, I believe Donna Southworth. I mean, he's He's giving me compliments. He knows who I am. Not that Bill's better looking than anybody. We all know that. But, I mean, he was smart that way. He, had, he was a smart individual. He thought, he thought the big picture because some of the things that we found later on in the investigation, probably no one has really ever thought about. And he used those to his advantage. Let me, let me ask you all this, too, while I've got you together, just from experience. Is that something you saw more than once with a, a suspect or a defendant? Because I know when I did this, you could smell that pretty quick. And it actually, we don't have to go into detail, but there was a different interview format I would use with those people. It was something you saw more than once? I would say yes, Chris. Yes. Oh, yes. You mm-hmm. Your vocabulary would have to change that you used in your interview. Your approach has to be really soft. You yeah. have to play to their advantage. In those first 10 minutes of that interview, you're kind of sizing up what type of interview this is going to be. And then you start deploying the tactics that Chris talks about, about we need to get this person to talk. And so you've got to you got to go to the, what makes them the most comfortable to kind of tell you the story. And I'll be honest, Chris and I went in pretty confident that we were going to get this gentleman to confess to what we knew pretty quickly. Because Chris and I have worked together for a long time and we do interviews very well. In fact, when I'm saying something, Chris is thinking what I'm probably going to say next and vice versa. So we work very well in the box. And that's one of our favorite things to do in any homicide investigation is to just interview the suspect. So honestly, we walked in there thinking we're going to get this finished probably in the next hour or two. Yeah, tell me real quick, what's the box? Because I think I've used that before and didn't explain it. Uh, the interview room where we interview the suspect the, that we believe could be the homicide suspect. That's just something I think the audience isn't aware of. But I love getting these terms out that they've probably never heard of before. It's a very small room. Sound, it's it's soundproof. And the there's a table and two chairs or three chairs, however many are in there. It's uh, There's no windows. And you can get closer to the person you're interviewing you you can back your chair out but there's nowhere for them to go even if you leave the door open they still feel like gosh this is a small room i'm sweating so at that point you know if it's going to be a good interview or not 
a lot of the individuals, just to kind of give you some comparison, a lot of people that we talk to watch a lot of the first 48. So that's probably a good thing to compare it to is what you see is the bo- what the box is. What we're talking about is what they see is the interview room on the first 48. Perfect. So you've got this guy who's thinking that he's going to outwit you all, and he's a great manipulator, and he thinks he's very convincing. So you change up your tactics to make him think he's going to help you all figure out where his wife is, right? That's right, because he doesn't even know at this time that we know where she's at. So he's thinking that he's convinced you all she's ran off with his boyfriend. Once again, happens all the time. And you all know the truth, but you're seeing what he knows. So when you get him in there, what happens? I wish we could show the video because body language says a lot. And in this interview, he is instantly closed up once we enter the box with him. Um, he's got his legs crossed. He acts like he's comfortable. He's got his arms crossed. Um, and just kind of give you some visual of how the box works is the lead investigator typically takes the front seat or the front chair to, uh, at the table that divides. And it's not between the two. So basically the suspect is sitting just across or at an angle of you. The table is just in the corner. And then the secondary typically takes the, the back seat of the, of the box. And so he is closed up. He's wishing to try to give us as much information that he can. Chris and I approach it with that your wife's missing. We want to find her. He's very open about how she wants to always be with her boyfriend. In fact, that evening she was on the phone with her boyfriend the night before. I apologize. Um, so that's probably where she's at. And we're kind of maybe blowing this out of proportion. And he even told us that he called the police. And when he does that, that's good for us, right? Because we know later on we can get that recording. So he tells us he called the police and told them it was no big deal. She's done this before. She's left for eight hours at a time and went to a hotel with her boyfriend. He doesn't mention his name immediately, but about a minute, 30 seconds, he throws her boyfriend's name right out. This gives us a suspect. And that's a red flag for detectives during the interview. If you're in there for three minutes and in half of that three minutes, he's giving you a name of who probably she's with, or if something happened, it's him. Then you know, hey, we need to delve a little bit deeper into this guy because he's throwing, he's deflecting everything we're asking about him. But it also gives you a lead. So you know where to go from there. So back at the fourplex, the scene is secured. You all have him down there. And then what transpires next? Do you all just talk to him and let him go with the pretenses of we're going to keep looking for her? We'll let you know when we find her. Or well, what happens after that interview? Yeah, it's going to be, you know, because so I was doing the search warrant. So now I've gone and met a judge at about seven o'clock at night, gotten this sign so we can search the house and the property. And they're still talking. Chris and Bill are talking with Donald and the daughters and everything. And we're starting the search warrant. Then I leave the scene because I'm in homicide at the time, not in crime scene. So I go back and I'm kind of watching the interview and they are going at it. And uh, he becomes very irritated with Bill because a good thing that Bill does is if if you're going to create a lie, you have to create that lie the same way every time. And that's very hard to do. I mean, if you're a parent, you know that's what you use against your kids anyway, right? So you went out, huh? Where'd you go? You know, that kind of thing. And when you know they went out drinking because you found the bottle in the back of the car, they can't be exact. So Bill was very good in asking him, okay, tell me about your day today. And he would go through it. And later on, we could use, and we did use that against him. He said his daughter never left his side. Every time he went to look for Umi, she was with him. She, she was right attached at his hips, basically is what he said. So in the meantime, while we have him there, again, the two daughters are being interviewed by crimes against children detectives. The great thing about technology is we have our cell phones in the in the interview room. So we're getting texts from Dave. I've got the warrant signed. They're processing the scene now. The crimes against children detectives say these girls have a high IQ. Speaking with them is like speaking with a doctor. So they're interviewing with the girls and we're just trying to get Don to tell us if she's missing, where would she be? And he is going into his love life, would you say, Bill? Yeah, so he he starts talking about, he loves talking about himself. So he would start doing that. And when we started pressing him about the information about where he had been, he finally had, had explained to us that he worked for UPS. And in fact, he had been at work from 3.17 
until 11 a.m. until he came home. And at that point, when he arrived home, her daughter had been at home when she when he arrived. And once he was home, he saw her car. He believed that she had been picked up and was probably out with another another guy. As the interview continued, as Chris said, the interview became a little bit back and forth between the two of us. And like Chris said, he was trying to basically use everything I was saying against myself versus him actually giving us any information. After the interview had finished, um, it was probably an hour, hour and 15 minutes. But what had made it stop or how why the interview stopped at that point was because I'd received a phone call. Yeah, I was and so say, I'd that stepped was a out. pretty big uh, event in this case. Tell mm-hmm. us about the phone call. Uh, it was a... It was a call you never want to get. Hey, you know there's more to the story, so go download the next episode like the true crime fan that you are. The Murder Police Podcast is hosted by Wendy and David Lyons and was created to honor the lives of crime victims so their names are never forgotten. It is produced, recorded, and edited by David Lyons. The Murder Police Podcast can be found on your favorite Apple or Android podcast platform as well as at murderpolicepodcast.com which is our website and has show notes for imagery and audio and video files related to the cases you're going to hear. We are also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and YouTube which has closed caption available for those that are hearing impaired. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe for more and give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you download your podcast from. Subscribe to the Murder Police Podcast and set your player to automatically download new episodes so you get the new ones as soon as they drop. And please, tell your friends. Lock it down, Judy.